Hello, hello everybody. My name is Dean of the Ink Guild and welcome back to another episode of Shorthand. Today we're going to be looking back at episode 7 where Gabe, Alex, and I look back at our personal writing pet peeves. And, you know, they're pet peeves. They're very, very small things, but they do tend to annoy us quite a bit. So we'd just like to give a disclaimer early on and say that um, for my early bit, or for my first pick, um, I'm talking about adjectives but really i mean adverbs so please you know to keep that in mind i know it can be confusing but like i don't know i don't know why i was mixing the two when i when we were recording the episode so if you like this episode of shorthand you can always look back at the original episode which is up on our channel you can follow our social media below for more updates on our shorthand series as well as anything else we put up and with all that being said let's get right into the highlights Going straight into it, my first pet peeve um, was something that I was guilty of with my first draft of my book, and those are adverbs. It hinders, like it hindered me from describing the scene out in a more fleshed out, um, kind of imag imaginative way. It really limits just how much one person can see the scene. It's so vague, like, and I and me personally, like, I don't want that to. Like, I don't want that to be my kind of story. Like, I want my own imagination and I want my own um, kind of, um, like, I, I want my own world to come alive through description and imagery and with adjectives. In my drafts, I hate it. I really hate it. I know better now because the scenes are a lot more fleshed out. They have a lot more imagination and color to them, basically. But in place of that, in the first draft were adjectives that were super, like, super generic, super basic. It didn't really have that much color to the scene. Like, it just kind of vaguely, like, it gave, um, it gave the interpretation to people reading it that, like, here, you can imagine the scene how you want it. And I guess over time, having those adjectives there kind of, uh, kind of hindered me from showing off my own kind of creativity. I feel like that's a writer thing where like when you're like young as a writer you're kind of like oh well I want everyone to be able to relate, relate to this so maybe if I write it a little bit vague they'll be able to put themselves into it and yeah. then it, it'll be like that but then you get older or like more experienced and you're like well this is my story this is my vision I want people to see it how I see it and then the yeah. more specific you get yeah the better that's, that's exactly the point like over time, once I've gotten like more confident in storytelling and imagery, I suddenly didn't need an adjective, or I suddenly didn't need the use of adjectives that much, if at all. So when I look back on my old work, it's like, uh, it's 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 annoying. Like it's it's a pet peeve for sure. Alex, how about you? What would you be one of your uh, first of many pet peeves? Something that I see come up a lot in fan fiction and like unpublished works and first drafts is. Uh, people don't know how to use punctuation properly. And that drives me crazy. <laughs> um, uh, just specifically, even thinking about it is making me cringe. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it drives me crazy. Just like if you don't know how to use a certain kind of punctuation, look it up. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, just like because I find when I'm reading something and I see like there's a comma in the wrong spot or like people are misusing like quotation marks, it just like pulls me right out of the story and it takes me a while to get like back into it just because I'm just like just do your just do it properly. Um, yeah. But I don't know it's probably easier said than done. But seriously, if you don't know how to use a certain kind of punctuation, look it up. Even if you're like a little bit uncertain, mm -hmm. look it up. Yeah because you're reading a lot of fan fiction like how different is that compared to some of the published works that you're familiar with in terms of like how bad it is uh it varies um like there's some fan fiction that's probably better than published works 
than certain published works. Um, Cause I mean, like, like any community, there's different levels of skill in fan fiction and some people are like brilliant writers and some people are definitely struggling a little bit more um, mm-hmm. to the point that I find some fics like completely unreadable just because of like the grammar and punctuation errors. Yeah. Oh God. It, it, it's honestly like, I, like I, I ask because it's so hard to kind of understand it. Like obviously when it comes to like, pr- like published works, like you have multiple editors probably at a time looking at your work, making sure all your punctuation is working. Um, and I know that there's like, I know that there's like creative uses for punk, like using punctuation, but at, it still works. It's still meant to work. If you don't know how to use a colon for, if you don't know how to use a colon though, and you're just using it like for whatever, it's so obvious that yeah. you don't know how to use it. I know it can be difficult as, especially if you're writing, like if you're starting to write or if you're taking it seriously for the first time to understand how ellipses work or understand how dashes colons semicolons especially like it can be really confusing there's also also, like three different kinds of dashes which is also confusing which is why people like as a writer like this is the same thing for like artists in general like no matter what like we can't be afraid to look things up in order to further our understanding of them okay uh gabe how about you what would your first pick be to introduce my first pick, I'm I'm going to read an excerpt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> from Ready Player One. Oh, oh okay. boy. All right. I made a big entrance when I arrived in my flying DeLorean, which I'd obtained by completing a Back to the Future quest on the planet Zemeckis. The DeLorean came outfitted with a non-functioning flux capacitor, but I'd made several additions to its equipment and appearance. First, I'd installed an artificially intelligent onboard computer named Kit, pure purchased in an online auction into the dashboard, along with a matching red Knight Rider scanner just above the DeLorean's grill. Then I'd outfitted the car with an oscillation overthruster, a device that allowed me to travel through solid matter. Finally, to complete my 80s super vehicle theme, I'd slapped a Ghostbusters logo on each of the DeLorean's gull-winged doors then added personalized plates that read Ecto-88. So, my first pet peeve is over-referencing. <laughs> I think the biggest thing with for me with Ready Player One is the over-reliance on pop culture references. Yeah, That's something that bugs the ever-loving out of me, especially in science fiction literature, but in any sort of, like in anything really an over-reliance on like pop culture references to relate to a scene always really bugs me because it makes me feel like the author isn't confident that we can relate to this scene on their on on our own so they need to connect it to something that someone else made so that we can be like oh i know that thing this guy knows that thing i'm relating to this now that's how this works uh (laughs) yeah um but then it also creates this issue especially with science fiction literature that's set in the future was there no new pop culture media created in the span of time between when the book is published and when the story takes place for these characters yeah there's also it it super dates a book so like if a book is something that like that's really big at the moment well in like five years that th- probably no one's even going to remember that anymore no yeah. and it's especially jarring if that book is set in the future so it's like it's yeah. you're watching a movie that's set let's say let's say for example a movie that's set or, or you're reading a book that's set 50 years from now and they make constant callbacks to modern pop culture references or 90s or 80s pop culture references that it it, it dates it and it gives it this weird aura that nothing new has been created in this time span because no one makes like relevant pop culture references. Everyone always talks about just the very, very conveniently the the books and movies that came out at the time of the books publishing. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's something that I every time that I, I see it, it always pulls me right out. I guess moving on to our next set of picks, um, this one or my next set is. 
again, one that I'm guilty of. But it's also... It's also, like, one of my favorite authors is also guilty of this, and that is the overuse of ellipses. Or the ellipse to the casual listeners who are listening. An ellipse is the three dots that often would come before a pause and then continue the thought on from there, which is, surprisingly, when I first found out about it, not how you're supposed to do it. <laughs> like, you can use a dash to indicate a pause, especially in speech. Like, it's something that bugs me when I'm, t- like, when I read, um, when I'm reading dialogue and then someone uses an ellipses as a pause instead of using a dash. I say, I say this is a pet peeve of mine because I'm guilty of it. Because, again, in my first draft of my book, I would use ellipses for pauses and after later knowing better, it's like, yeah, this doesn't work out. This doesn't thing, this doesn't indicate a pause as well as I think it will. Like, I would just then use dashes and... If even, like, I didn't even need to use it at all. Like, ellipses can be meant for powerful scenes, and they can be meant for pretty subtle moments, actually. But suddenly, if you're overusing it every page or something, it's so noticeable, and it's really irritating. I guess to reflect on someone else's work, um, Sarah J. Mass is very synonymous with using ellipses in her works. <laughs> like, and M dashes. And M dashes, yeah, but... Um, that's not what this is about though, it's, but yeah. Yeah, it's so frequent. Like, I've counted maybe, like, six, seven, like, use of ellipses in one page of, like, of, of one of her books. And, and, and believe me, this is not to, like, knock on Sarah J. Mass. I'm not Alex, but, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not her, but... It is so apparent when you are using ellipses, and at least when Sarah J. Mass does it, I can understand, like, how it's used then. I understand how she is using it, and I understand pretty much just how it works, but that doesn't exclude just how much of it it is. Like, I'm pretty sure if you were to take all the ellipses from a Sarah J. Mass book, it would consist of maybe a fifth of that entire story, <laughs> or that of that entire run, like, because... Think- I think people use them because uh, cause when people write things that they want to be dramatic, people tend to lean in towards like the melodramatic side. And I think overuse of ellipses would definitely fall into melodrama. Yeah. All right, Alex, do you have a second one? Uh, the second one that I wrote down was uh, forced heteronormativity. <laughs> what I mean by forced heteronormativity is like, you have no matter how many people are in the story they always end up paired off like a guy and a girl a guy and a girl a guy and a girl and i'm like if you have straight people in your stories whatever that's fine but not everyone needs to be in a relationship a lot of times authors will like twist their characters personalities just so so that they fit into a more heteronormative couple Mm -hmm. um where, like, the guy is, like, the aggressive, protective type, and the woman is, like, the delicate, I need someone to protect me type, even if that doesn't, like, necessarily fit that character's actual personalities. So many authors do this, and I think at this point it's become such a norm that a lot of people don't even realize it when they're writing. But, like, when you're reading, it's really apparent where you're like, wow, there's another couple, like... To the point where if you're reading a long series, you see the first book and you see like all the main characters listed out and you're like, okay, so those two are going to end up together and those two are going to end up together. And I'm, every time I've done this, I'm almost always right. Yeah, I would love and I need to see more like more LGBT like relationships in YA specifically because there are a lot of LGBT youth. Yes. That goes hand and in hand. That. Like a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, but I also feel like part of forced heteronormativity for me is um, displaying what I think is a really unhealthy like representation of straight relationships even mm-hmm. um, that I feel like is, well, it's negative to like LGBT youth because they're not seeing themselves represented, but it's also negative for like straight youth because they're seeing the same picture over and over again of like the dominant male and the submissive female and like obviously people's relationships are gonna be like that hopefully in a healthy way um but some people's relationships are not gonna be like that and i feel like there needs to be more more variety 
in straight relationships in YA works as well. Like, also, sometimes sometimes you don't need the romance. I yeah. hate to break it to you, but sometimes you do not need the romance in your story. Yeah, like, there are other things in a youth's life aside from wanting to hook up. <laughs> or aside from wanting a relationship. There's exactly. so many other things to worry about. You have, like, a teenager who's in the middle of fighting a war. Do you really think that, like, romance is the number one thing on their mind? I, I was about to say abolish romantic subplots, but I don't mean it. Yes! <laughs> Let's do it. No more horny in my fiction. <laughs> if you want horny in your fiction, go read horny fiction. Yes. Yeah. We, have, we have whole genres specifically for that. Yes. Yeah. Anyway... <laughs> This is just the call Sarah J. Moss out episode. I don't mean to. I I, I love her work. <laughs> I really like her work. I, 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 oh, God. I'm digging myself into a hole. I'm digging myself into a hole. Anyway. <laughs> Gabe, uh, do you have a second pick? Simps. <laughs> I'm sorry? I'm sorry? <laughs> My second pick is Simps. <laughs> it's... I didn't... I, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to give us more man I just, I'm like are you talking about like character simps or like okay, audience yeah, simps I, actually, like, I, had a, I, had, I had a more I had a more force heteronormative simps like I had a more intellectual way to describe this but I, I thought that would be better to just it's a, it's go a clip. right in yeah it's a um, clip so, okay so what I'm talking about is that is sort of tangentially related to what you're talking about Alex which is I call them simps because it's an easy way to refer to them, but what I'm what I'm talking about is characters whose entire character arc and whose entire dynamic with other characters is predicated on whether or not they bone their romance interest by the end of the book. And that's all they care about, and that's all that there is that's like that's their one armed man. That's all that matters to them. They don't have a personality outside of that. They don't have goals or dreams outside of that. They just they wanna they want to either they 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 want either. It's usually straight characters too that that, that does this. I've never I've never seen a gay character whose entire role is that they have to get with the partners. It's just it's it's either it's either again Ready Player One, the main character's whole thing. Like he has a goal in the main plot, I guess, but the, most of the book is focused on the fact that he has a crush on gamer girl supreme and he's spends the whole book like he meets her and then that's a, that's another thing he meets her and then he's in love with her and he is devoted to her and he wants to like spend the rest of his life with her after one meeting that's simp shit and i'm sick of seeing it i can't blame you at all yeah you yeah. Yeah, yeah, now that you've explained it, I absolutely 100% agree. I hate that so much. I, I don't read a lot of romantic fiction, but I see it a lot in romantic comedies where the like the main character, if the main character is a woman, then their whole role is to be obsessed is to be obsessed over is to be obsessed with the man with that the male lead so much. Yeah, and if the male lead is the protagonist, then the female lead spends the whole movie. Then he spends the whole movie being obsessed with her. No one, there's no mutuality in their relationship. There's no, there's nothing in. There's nothing like. Neither of them are actually people. They're just, I, I they're these caricatures of relationships, and I hate seeing it. It bugs me so much. I do. You do see this a lot in anime as well. Uh, where there's just a character who's like the crux of their whole character, and even not even just in harem and in like harem, but like just anime in general. There's usually one thing that I noticed a lot is there's there's I don't know if there's a specific oh. trope name for this, but there's like one if it's a pretty if it's like a pretty boy protagonist like Kogias, then there's usually one girl character who's a supporting mm -hmm. character whose whole role is to be obsessed with the pretty boy. Yeah, like. Uh, I like Shirley in Code Geass or uh, or Misa Misa in, in Death Note. Yeah, they just they don't exist as a person; they just exist as an obsessor yeah. over the protagonist. It's very annoying. That's why that's why I had to stop watching. I, I I quit Future Diary because I can't remember her name, but the main girl in Future Diary is like was just so obsessed with the protagonist, and I was just like, 
Do you have nothing? Do you have no other character traits? You just yeah. It's funny we talk about like having no character traits because um, moving on to my final pick, uh, it's Mary Sue's. Like when you think of a Mary Sue, you think of like a character with literally no imperfections. They are like one hundred percent like amazing, and they'll carry you through like an action-packed scene, and you don't ever have to worry about them being hurt or being traumatized or whatever. Like there's no consequences for a Mary Sue because they are literally boring. <laughs> like it's it's so bothering to me because it's like people are afraid to like write flaws for characters. And I'm like, that's what makes your characters unique. It is with their flaws and how they handle like consequences and reactions and all that stuff. If your character is so perfect that they don't even have to worry about any of that, and their entire purpose is, just, is to just pull the plot along, then what's the point in even investing in the character? Like as you like as you know, as listeners have been keeping up with, like I love my characters. But if there's no substance to that character, like if there's no character traits, like you said, Gabriel, if there's no like defining things that humanize this character and make it more like interesting, what's the point? Anyway, Alex, do you have a third and final pet peeve? Uh, yes. Um, this one's like really niche, um, but especially in like fantasy and like speculative fiction when people have to come up with their own like country names and stuff and they come up with really bad ones <laughs> adding me adding all of my previous writings I'm at, well okay no this is this is definitely something that came from my own writing but i also see it in other works like making up names in fantasy or like or in some cases not making up names in fantasy and like how you use them I think it's it's predominantly with I guess fantasy and like sci-fi like really imaginative series where you have to like expand on like you know make yeah. sure everyone has doesn't have John as a name or not every place is called New York. Yeah. Right cuz that'd be one thing. That'd be a huge bother if you were set like if you had an entire fantasy setting with like gorgeous settings and stuff and your capital's Chicago. That ain't gonna fly. <laughs> Yeah, like, I get it. Like, for, like for me, like, as someone who has done um, a lot of fan... Like, my book, Zeno, is fantasy. It And so, like, I, it's imperative that every word that I have either made up or, like, I've based it off of something has a pronunciation guide to the best of my own ability, right? Because, you know, I can understand, like, how I say it is probably going to be completely different to how someone else is saying it, so... And obviously that's something I struggle with too because like I have my whole planet where I've literally made up words and meanings for like all the different names and countries and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's that's something I've struggled with too like because obviously I created my world when I was pretty young and so a lot of the a lot of my original names for the places were just like absolutely terrible. And so that's something that I'm I've gone back multiple times and like tried to make better just because I want names to be pronounceable i want them to be consistent i want them to be unique but i also want them to evoke like certain you know certain images yeah um and so i think like coming up with names in in your fantasy and sci-fi stories is something that's really important and a lot of people don't take it seriously enough yeah like you don't want people scratching their heads trying to just say someone or say like pronounce the name of your country for the entirety of the book like you want it to be a one and done thing or you know you mess up once and then you kind of pick it up from there like you want it to be like relatively easy to say and not to like i'm just going off on a tangent but like yeah just if i guess for fantasy writers out there like if you're going to invent countries and languages and names like be mindful that how you pronounce things has to make at least enough sense so that your audience can definitely keep up with you because then it's just going to be like a pet peeve for them. If like for this great book, they may have like an awesome story and great characters that they can't even pronounce anything. Yeah. And that's something I'm still struggling with. Cause like, you know, I, I will say like, Oh, my main character's name is Alahe, but even I mess it up sometimes. Yeah. Um, I still think to an extent, even if, 
you have something like that, I think it's important to be consistent. Yeah. Like if you have like, like if your names are all over the place and like you have the same letter pronounced like 700 different ways or whatever, then it's going to be a lot more confusing than if it's consistent, even if it's hard to pronounce. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, I agree. All right. Uh, Gabe, how about you? What would your third and final pick be? Uh, My third pick, uh, it's a pretty simple one, but it's something that really bugs me. Uh, Even though it's a very small thing, uh, protagonist has heterochromia. Oh my god. (laughs) I am... (laughs) I I am awake. I I feel it. (laughs) I don't think I've read many stories with that, actually. The, every I time think... I do read one, I'm like, "Oh, yeah. really? Does does he? Does she? Do they have heterochromia? Yeah. Really? How? I... What a what an interesting trait to focus on. Mm-hmm. That tells me so much about this character's personality. Probably how they're not like other girls, TM, and have heterochromia because ooh ooh, <laughs> they have two sides to them." Ooh, they're secretive. Yeah. Ooh. If you want to like address something about a character's personality through their physical appearance, I just feel like heterochromia is such a cheap way to do it. It's just like it's just it you someone has heterochromia and it's like, okay, I they have two sides to them. I don't know, I feel like there I feel like there are ways that you can address someone's personality through their physical appearance in ways that are more engaging than their eye colors are different. I, I get your arg- or I get why it's a pet peeve. It's like they have two different eyes. Okay, and yeah, where's the substance? I feel like if you're gonna do something like that, it needs to have a purpose. Like I definitely have some characters that have that. Like I have one character I can think of off the top of my head. Her name's Reina, um, and the reason she has heterochromia is because uh, she's like a half vampire. And, like, the way that vampirism and, like, that kind of stuff works in this particular world is it kind of, like, takes over slowly. So, like, one of her eyes is, like, a red vampire eye and the other one is, like, a normal eye, but it's slowly being taken over by the vampirism. So, eventually, she won't have heterochromia anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's, like, if it's just this one thing that's just there because it looks cool, eh. I don't like it. (laughs) I think I, I think I mentioned this in a different episode that we did, but I think what I said was like you can accomplish what you want to accomplish with heterochromia with an eye patch, and it will number one look way cooler, and number two say way more about the character through the of their like backstory. And I guess that's why I say it's not like it's a pet peeve because I mean I'm sure if someone makes a really good book with a heterochromia protection. I'm sure I've read something where a character has heterochromia and I just can't remember it right now. I, I don't know. I think when I whenever I notice it, it does bug me. I think on that point though, I think we'll <laughs> I think I think that's a good way yeah. to end up, end it. So uh thanks for listening everyone. This has been another hectic recording, I guess as it always will be.